Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ivan. Uh, thank you, Pastor David, for the invitation to join all of you on this very special occasion of the BPCIS churches reflecting on Good Friday together. Will you allow me to pray for God's help now as we ask God to help us to understand the significance of Good Friday from His Word? Let's pray. Father, how we need Your Word. Your Word tells us more about You and Your will for us expressed in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your Word also tells us more about ourselves, our desperate need for You and the futility of a life lived apart from You. And today, please transform our hearts, our minds and our wills as Your Spirit teaches us from your word. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Friends, unless we have seared consciences, we will be aware of one thing about ourselves, that we are sinners who are slimy and dirty and grimy on the inside. Our guilty consciences weigh us down the spouse we ought to love but we neglect, the child whose spirit we crush, the friend whose loyalty we betray, the pawn habit, that envious heart, the repeated moral failures in this pandemic era. We have sleepless nights. Dark and gloomy clouds fill our days. Guilt eats us up from the inside. And that's why Good Friday is such a relief for so many of us because on Good Friday, we remember that Jesus' blood can purify our guilty conscience. It can cleanse us from within. It can secure the forgiveness of our sins and in so doing, save us from God's coming judgment. And so after every Good Friday, we walk home with joy in our hearts knowing that our slates are wiped clean. But as soon as we get home, what happens? Well, Good Friday becomes bad Saturday. We are unkind to our wives again. We are cruel to our children again. We click on that link again. <laughs> our hearts are envious again. We are apathetic about Christian things again. We sin again and again and again, and sometimes in worse ways than we sinned before. And so maybe today we have this nagging doubt in our mind. <laughs> I, I really want to believe that Jesus' blood can cleanse me, but does God know who I really am? I am a serial offender. I keep getting myself dirty. Will God change His mind the thousandth time that I sin? Surely there is something I can do, I need to do on my part. I can't just rely on Jesus' blood. And so, when we have these nagging doubts, it makes us turn to our old solutions for dealing with our guilt. Now, some of us resort to hurting ourselves as some form of penance. Some of us run away, we bury our guilt, we ignore it doesn't exist. Some of us do religion, we do good. It's like applying a white paint over our black sins. Some of us think that we are like grimy, dirty cars and that we have to go for regular car washes to be clean again. Uh, guilty conscience? Go through a car wash of religion every week. Dirty soul? Go through a car wash of good works once a week. We apply these solutions repeatedly because we doubt if Jesus' blood can deal with our repeated sins. And we take comfort that they are tangible, concrete things that we can do. Now, this was probably how the Hebrew Christians felt too. They were raised in Old Testament religion. 
they probably were thinking that I believe Jesus can cleanse me, but I have this nagging doubt. I am a repeat offender. I keep getting myself dirty. And so to be honest, I very much like the assurance of those repeated animal sacrifices at the temple. That's my regular car wash. It seems like something tangible and concrete is happening over there. And that's why the aim of the author in Hebrews chapter 10 is this. He wants to show that the repeated solution of animal sacrifices does not work. In fact, these repeated solutions not only don't work, but it serves to remind us that we are sinners and therefore the only lasting effective solution to our sin problem is the better blood of Jesus. And so the author wants us to hold fast to that. So that's a heads up of where we are going today. Now to get us to that destination, the author makes two main points. And I put those two main points in the outline in front of you. It's a compare and contrast. Uh, number one, what do animal sacrifices achieve? And then number two, what does Jesus' sacrifice achieve? So point number one on your outlines, animal sacrifices makes people remember their sins. So the author first tells us the limitations of the animal sacrifices. So look with me at verse 1. Verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Now perfecting here in the context of Hebrews means purifying. It means cleansing. It means the forgiveness of sins. And the author says the animal sacrifices cannot achieve that. Now, what's his evidence for that? What's his proof? Well, look at verse 2. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. In other words, if the animal blood could really clean you, the worshipper would be aware of this and he would stop offering those sacrifices. So imagine if you went on a buffet lunch with me and you saw that I got up from the table and I repeatedly went to the buffet line and I came back to the table with plate after plate of food. And seeing my actions, you would be right to conclude that Ivan must still be hungry because he keeps going back to the buffet line. If he was full, he would stop going. Now that's the same logic here in Hebrews. We know that the Old Testament worshipper has a sense that he's not decisively cleansed by the animal sacrifices because he keeps going back to the altar. If he was decisively cleansed by animal blood, he would stop going. Now at this point, a hand is raised amongst the Hebrew Christians. There is a question. And the question is this. We, we know that the animal sacrifices can't permanently cleanse someone, but surely it can temporarily cleanse someone. Uh, isn't it like a weekly car wash? Uh, the car gets dirty, you send it to the car wash, it's temporarily cleaned, then it gets dirty again, and then you offer up another sacrificial car wash. Isn't that what's happening? Now look at the answer in verse 3. Verse 3. But in these sacrifices, there is a removal of sins every year. Now, is that what verse 3 says? You see, the Hebrew Christians would have read verse 3 that way. But that's not what verse 3 says. Look at verse 3 again. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. 
So not only does the blood of uh, bulls and goats not remove sin, but the act of sacrificing the animals actually reminds you that you are a sinner. So can you see? The animal sacrifices do the exact opposite of what you want it to do. Now let me share with you this uh, illustration which I heard some years ago from another uh, preacher. So imagine me during my uni days. I studied in uni in the UK. And at that time, I lived on the outskirts of London. And I still remember the monthly rental of my rental place. It was £280 a month. So I want you to imagine the start of the month. My landlord, Norman, he comes to me and says, our rent is due. And I say to him, I, I've, I've got no money. <laughs> I've spent it all on, on fish and chips. I, I tell you what, let me write you an IOU. You know what an IOU is? It's a, it's a piece of paper saying you owe, owe a certain amount of money to someone. Uh, Norman, uh, my landlord, says, that's fine, I accept it. And so what I do, I take out a piece of A4 paper and I write there, I, Ivan Chow, owe Norman Moody 280 pounds. He accepts it. The next month comes, I write him another IOU. I, Ivan Chow, owe Norman Moody 280 pounds. And this goes on month after month after month. Now friends, how do you think I would feel about paying my rent this way? I tell you, it would be terrible. It would be very stressful because every month, as I write down the IOU, I'm thinking to myself, that's another £280 I owe that I don't have. The IOU doesn't make me feel better. The IOU is not really paying the rent. The IOU only serves to remind me that I have a debt that is ballooning. And that's the same with Old Testament religion. If the people understood that animal blood cannot pay the debt of sin, then every year going to the altar was like giving an IOU. You sacrifice an animal one year, next year you sacrifice another animal, the following year you sacrifice another animal, and all this time you are thinking, I owe God for all this sin and I cannot pay. The IOU doesn't pay the debt of sin. It only reminds me of my debt that is ballooning. So what was meant to relieve my guilty conscience? Can you see? It only highlights the problem even more. So friends, can you see? The old repeated solutions don't work. And therefore, we need a better solution. We need Jesus' blood. Point number one, the animal sacrifices makes people remember their sins. But point number two on your outlines, Jesus' sacrifice makes God forget people's sins. That's the one big truth of verse 5 to verse 18. That Jesus' sacrifice makes God forget our sins. Now, there are three things the Hebrew author wants to say about this one big truth. And he uses three Old Testament passages to say those three things. So first, point 2a on your outlines. Jesus' sacrifice is God's will. Now we saw that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. We see it here also in Hebrews chapter 10. You see, the Hebrew Christians would have really struggled with putting aside the animal sacrifices. They would have thought to themselves, God instructed us to do it, so how can we ignore God's will? And so what the Hebrews author must do here is he must show that Jesus' sacrifice is God's ultimate will, superseding the animal sacrifices. 
And to do this, uh, the author quotes from Psalm 40, and he puts the words of Psalm 40 onto Jesus' lips. So look with me at verse 5. Uh, verse five. Uh, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Animal sacrifices and offerings you, God, have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In animal burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Now the author's explanation of Psalm 40, look at verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. And then here's the punchline. He does away with the first, the animal sacrifices, in order to establish the second, Jesus' sacrifice. You see, friends, when the reality comes, the shadow must give way. Now, what is this reality? What is God's will? Look at verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, to sanctify someone means making that person holy. It's another way of saying cleansing them, forgiving them, perfecting them. God's will is that people are sanctified not through animal sacrifices, but through Jesus' sacrifice. That's his first point. Now, the second point, a point 2B on your outlines, is that Jesus' sacrifice is one effective sacrifice. So look with me at verse 11. Uh, verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. In other words, the, animal, the annual animal sacrifices, they were ineffective. The, the ceaseless activity of the human priest running here and there, offering this sacrifice and that sacrifice, that was futile. The, the weekly car washers of religion, they did nothing. The cars are still grimy with sin. But, and here the author quotes Psalm 110, but look at verse 12. Verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. This high priest sits down. His work is done. His work is effective. God doesn't send him out to do another sacrifice. He has done what he has come to do. Now, what's his effective work? Look at verse 14. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, at home, I have a barbecue pit and it's one of those barbecue pits that runs on gas. Now, I'm a pretty uh, lazy guy, so I never ever clean my barbecue pit. And as a result of that, uh, it's quite disgusting. It's greasy all over. There is a thick and crusted layer of black grime. There are chow ta pieces of chicken and steak sticking uh, to the grill. But, but sometimes, even the, the dirty grill gets to me. I, I cannot tahan how dirty it is. So I remember one day I try uh, to clean it. What I do is I, I take out the grill, and I bring it to the bathroom, and I try to bathe it like I'm bathing one of my children. So I turn on the shower head, I take the soap, I've got a metal brush with metal bristles, and I scrub really, really hard, and I scrub repeatedly. But, but none of the black grime goes off. And so I try again. I put more soap. 
I scrub again, more strength, faster, but none of the black grime comes off. And then one day, I discover at NTUC, Dr. Beckman's Active Gel Oven Cleaner. And it's incredible, it changes my life. Here's what the label says. Powerful and fast acting gel. The, the powerful active gel clings to vertical surfaces, uh, breaking down and removing encrusted burnt on, uh, burnt on food, dirt and grease from ovens, cooker tops, baking trays, grills and barbecues. And so I'm really excited. I can't wait to try it. I spray some of this stuff on the grill. And I leave it on for an hour as the instructions say. At the end of the hour, I take a piece of cloth and some warm, soapy water and I glide the cloth and my hand over the surface of the grill. And the grime miraculously comes off. Without effort, without hard scrubbing, without repeated scrubbing, it just comes off. Now why? Because the power is in the gel. It's not about how hard I scrub. It's not about how many times I scrub. It's all about the powerful and active gel. And, and Jesus' blood is like that. You know, with, with animal blood, with all these other solutions to our guilt that we try, we can scrub and scrub and scrub, but nothing happens. But with Jesus' blood, I lay it on once, and it washes off the grime of sin. How does that old hymn go? The fountain is filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Jesus' sacrifice is God's will, Jesus' sacrifice is powerfully effective. And finally, number three, Jesus' sacrifice has effects which last forever. The Hebrew author quotes now from Jeremiah 31. This is what Jesus' sacrifice achieves. It brings about the new covenant promises. So look at me at verse 15. Verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then here comes the punchline. This is the key new covenant promise. This is the major achievement of Good Friday. Look at verse 17. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. You see, here is the thing to banish those sleepless nights. Here is the thing to drive away those dark and gloomy clouds. Here is the thing to chase away the guilt. It is a forever forgiveness. Now friends, do you know the liberating wonder of forever forgiveness? You know, to appreciate this, you just have to compare it with the way that you and I forgive. You know, when you and I say that I forgive, Many times, that's just a saying, I'm going to forget about it now, <laughs> but the next time you hurt me, and I want to hurt you back, I'm going to bring up this offense again. We forgive, but we don't 
forget. When we say we forgive, the memories of those past offenses, they merely become a stockpile of weapons. When I say I forgive, I'm merely putting away those memories, those weapons in a room in my mind so that the next time you hurt me and I want to hurt you back, I take out a memory, a weapon from that room and I fire away at you. And because we humans forgive like that, I think sometimes we are tempted to think that God forgives us like that too. Uh, we think that God says, you know, He forgives us now. But when I sin the 1,000th time, we fear that God will go into His room and He will bring out those 999 offenses. And that's why you and I, I think, so desperately try to erase our guilt with our repeated solutions. Because we are afraid that one day, God might fire away. Well, Christian, will you look at verse 17 again? Will you plant this deep in your heart? This is what your God promises you. This is what your high priest, by his one sacrifice, has achieved for you on Good Friday. Verse 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. In other words, God says, I will never bring that up again. I will forget it forever. I will put all your sins in that room. I will lock up that room and I will blow up that room irreversibly. I will never ever take anything out from that room to condemn you again. Jesus' sacrifice makes God forget people's sins forever. And so if all that is true, then friends, can you see we just have one main application this Good Friday. It's the repeated refrain of the book of Hebrews, and it is this, that we are to hold fast to Jesus and not drift back to the old solutions for sin because they do not work. And in fact, today we see that they make the matter worse. They remind us that we are sinners. The endless animal sacrifices are a pile of IOUs. The self-hurt, the self-harm, it touches the skin, but it doesn't touch the guilty soul. Running away from our guilt, ignoring our guilt only reminds us that someone is chasing you. Religion and good works is just like a thin coat of white paint that you apply over a black wall. It only serves to emphasize that there are deeper and darker unresolved issues. But Jesus' blood, that is God's will to forgive us forever by one effective sacrifice. So friends, are you anxious about that room full of your sin? Good Friday is that annual reminder that God has blown up that room irreversibly. Do you feel unclean on the inside? Good Friday is that annual reminder that your cleanliness before God is not based on how hard or how often you scrub. It is not based on religion or zeal or good works. I wiped once without much effort and the grime fell off. Why? Because cleanliness before God is based only on that powerful, effective 
sacrifice of Jesus, my high priest. God's will is to forgive us forever by one effective sacrifice. Now, today is a very uh, special day for the BPCIS churches because it is a day of expressed unity. And it is very apt that it is Good Friday that brings together your fellowship of churches. Because Good Friday reminds us of the bedrock of Christian unity. More than just shared histories. More than just common convictions. More than just the ability to meet or not meet in these pandemic conditions. We are united because we are people who are all caught up in that same will of God. We are all forever forgiven sinners, cleansed by that one effective sacrifice. May this truth greatly enrich your fellowship in the years to come. Now in closing, I want to share with all of you a song that I heard a lot when I was a young boy. My parents played this song a lot. And this song came back to my mind when I was preparing uh, this sermon. It's a song about a man with nagging doubts. He's been in prison for three years. He has just been freed. He knows he's let down his wife. He's desperate to get back together with her, but he's not sure whether she wants him, whether she'll take him back, whether she'll forgive him. And so he writes her a letter. And he says in this letter, I've got to know what is mine or isn't mine. If you still want me, do you remember that old oak tree that stands in the center of the town square? If you still want me, will you tie a yellow ribbon so that as I come home, I can see it and I'll know? He takes a bus home and on that bus journey, he's full of regret and guilt over the choices he has made. He's full of nagging doubts. He is so nervous about what his wife might do or might not do. And he says, bus driver, please look for me. I can't bear to see what I might see. I, I'm really still in prison. And my love, she holds the key. A simple yellow ribbon is what I need to set me free. But he has his nagging doubts. And he thinks to himself, if I don't see a ribbon round the old oak tree, then I'll stay on the bus. And I'll forget about us. And I'll put the blame on me. The bus turns into the town square and suddenly the bus erupts with cheers. Why? Because they see not one yellow ribbon, but a hundred yellow ribbons. Overwhelming forgiveness irresistible love and grace. You have sinned a thousand times. You have sinned greatly. You have sinned this past week, this past month, this past year, and you think to yourself, does God still want me? Does He still forgive me? And the answer of Good Friday 
is yes. And it's not just a momentary forgiveness. It is a forever forgiveness. And it's not just a yes one time. It's not just a yes today and tomorrow. It is a yes a billion times over until the end of time. And how do we know? Because we look out the bus and we see the Lord Jesus hanging on that tree. And that's God's will to forgive us not just now, but forever. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father God, we are so aware that we are sinners before you. We are so aware that our guilty conscience weighs us down. Father, forgive us for turning to the old solutions for sin that do not work. And we thank you for reminding us that we have a better high priest who offers a better blood, a blood that is effective, a blood that wins us a forever forgiveness, so that as we sit on that bus, wondering if you still want us, wondering whether you still forgive us, your message on Good Friday is a resounding yes, now and forever. Father, we thank you for the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen.